Hey everybody, welcome to our monthly webinar on compliance. We are excited to be here. We're excited that you're here. And uh, this is our fifth monthly compliance webinar. The first three covered kind of a broad range of general compliance 101 topics. Um, but for the most recent two, we've explored one topic in depth. So last month we took a deep dive into adverse action. And today, as you know, we'll be doing the same for GQF. We do these webinars on compliance every month to give you a better sense of the different topics within compliance show you what we do, you know, what 10 Street does to help keep you compliant, let you know of any changes on the legal horizon, and ultimately help you avoid a lawsuit. So my name is Leah Kelly. I'm here with Shannon Wheeler, our general counsel. Hi, everyone. And today we're joined by Haley Hitchcock from our MarTech team, who, who has been with 10 Street for six years, and who many of you probably already know. Hi there. Haley is, sorry, Haley is extremely versed in DQF because of in her past life, she worked at Nexus Lexus as not a DQ audit, DOT auditor, but a mock DOT auditor. So her job was to visit clients and perform a mock audit on their DQF files to show them what they were missing and then help them learn what they needed to do differently to become compliant. So she's a great asset on this topic, and she has a wealth of knowledge from this experience and from working at 10th Street. So we're super grateful to have her with us. So let's get started. Please know that this webinar will be recorded and sent to you within the next 24 hours. Also, feel free to submit your questions at any time. We'll do our best to get to them as you ask them. But if we don't, we can get to them at the end of the webinar. You can ask questions using your, the text box under the questions section in your GoToWebinar panel. And uh, that's it for housekeeping. Shannon, whenever you're ready, we can get started. All right, sounds good. All right, everyone, as you know, uh, every one of these compliance webinars, if you've attended them before, you've seen the same legal <laughs> disclaimer. Um, the information on this webinar is offered um, solely for educational information and does not constitute legal advice. Um, I am an attorney. However, I represent 10th Street, and I do not and cannot represent um, you all. So, um, But we do want to be your partner in compliance. While we can't offer legal advice, um, we can give you the information that is available to us, um, but we recommend um, that you consult with qualified legal counsel on the legal issues, laws, and regulations that we talk about on this webinar, um, and we disclaim any warranties associated with this presentation or the information provided herein. All right, so on today's agenda, we are going to just talk broadly um, what DQF is. We're going to touch a little bit on um, DOT audits. Uh, we're going to go into the specifics of the FMCSR regulations and the requirements um, for a QF. And we're going to talk about what not to keep in a, a, a DQ file and some best practices. And then finally, we will touch on how we can help you manage um, your DQF files. All right, so broad overview, um, driver qualification file, that's what we're talking about when we say DQF. And I know it's referred to in a number of different ways, um, depends on who you talk to, um, DQ file or DQF, or sometimes it's just the file. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we'll kind of broadly say DQF here. Um, what is it? Uh, it's an FMCSA record keeping requirement and that trucking companies must meet for every driver. You can find the specific regulations at 49 CFR section 391. Um, I'm kind of getting into the legal lingo here when I start quoting statutes and regulations, but um, that's where you can find it. If you're interested in looking, you can literally just Google that and find a whole uh, wealth of information um, on all of the FMCSR. Um, okay, so why is it important, well, one, it's required by law, but two, it uh, you will almost certainly have to produce uh, DQFs in any DOT audit. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's probably the first thing that, that the DOT auditor will ask for. Um, so who is required to have um, a DQF? It's any driver of a commercial motor vehicle. Um, that is what the regulations define um, in, the in the regulations. Okay, so, um, but what does that mean? That means any drivers that operate under your DOT number need to have a driver qualification file. Um, so if they're employees, if they're independent contractors, 
whether they have CDLs or non-CDLs, if they are drivers that operate under your DOT number, you're going to want to have a DQF on them. Okay, and so going into an audit overview, um, what can you expect for a DQ, uh, or I'm sorry, a DOT audit? When I say DOT, I'm talking about the Department of Transportation. Um, the big thing here is that um, it, it's really not a matter of if you're going to have a, a DOT audit, it's a matter of when. Some companies can go um, 10 years without having a DOT audit. Um, but all it takes is a major accident or a roadside inspection or, you know, randomly pulled, uh, you know, query by the Drug and Alcohol Task Force. Um, but you're, you're at some point in time um, going to have a DOT audit. The number one most common reason for an audit is your CSA score. Um, it, I know and have heard from other companies that they monitor their CSA score um, daily, weekly, monthly, um, because that is that is really um, that is going to bring um, attention to you by a DOT auditor. Um, if there's a complaint, they might come audit you. If there's an, like I said, an accident, um, and then sometimes on roadside inspections. Um, actually, Haley probably has some good. Uh, um, knowledge about this. Um, Haley, what are some of the reasons that you had seen um, that companies would contact you in your prior life to go uh, do a, an audit before a DOT auditor would come in? Well, um, you know, it's kind of a hodgepodge, kind of as you described. Um, it can be a multitude of several different reasons that are kind of listed here. It could be random. You could just be randomly selected, and it's your time. Um, back in the day when, when we used to do a lot of audits and so forth, it also was tied to the number of vehicles. So you would see people that had a larger population of vehicles or employees tend to get, you know, um, randomly, we'll use that in quotes, randomly selected a little bit higher than those that kind of went under the radar. So I still think that holds true today, that the number of employees, the number of trucks that you have sometimes puts you on a radar. Um, doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. It just, you have a heightened um, amount of vehicles on the road. So it's something that they're just looking. But outside of that, CSA, once that came on board, that plays a huge role. Um, even though when rolling that out, you know, it was really t tumultuous when, when they rolled out CSA. So uh, we all understand the pain that comes through that. But that's mainly what it is. Fatalities um, that happen in accidents can sometimes prompt um, a more frequent type of uh, um, audit or if you've previously been audited before and had some, you know, acute or critical violations, then they're probably coming back in the near future. Okay, thank you. Um, so what do you all need to be concerned about with the DQF during a DOT audit? The main thing is, is that it must be produced on demand to a DOT auditor. Um, there are record keeping violations. Um, if you don't, if you don't keep these, um, it's usually in a DOT audit, they will, the, the auditor will look at select drivers. They'll likely pull out specific driver files. Um, it, it won't be give me every single one you have, um, but, but they are likely to pull out either randomly or drivers that have um, had accidents, things along those lines. They are likely to pull out specific drivers and then they can go back. Um, three years um, looking through the file, even if the driver has left the company. So um, it it really, um, yeah, it, it the, you want to make sure your DQF file is pristine um, the, when you're when you're getting ready to hand it over to a DOT auditor. Um, and then the other thing is is that DOT fines, whether it's acute, critical, for a record keeping violation, for other violations, they are going to apply to the DOT company, not to third parties. So if you have contracts with third parties for your DQF files, um, it, it those contracts might say you know or make guarantees or say things, but the DOT fine is going to apply to the DOT company, and then it would be up to you to go um, you know manage what a contract issues you have with third parties that might manage your DQF files. Um, but Haley, when a DOT auditor, 
would come in, would they give advance notice or did, could they just show up on the doorstep? Um, generally, they will. It, again, it depends on the circumstance. You know, if there's a massive, you know, situation where there's fatalities, um, high out of service, um, you know, those types of things, they might, you know, generally, they won't just show up. But the rule, you know, technically what they're supposed to do is give you about 48 hours notice. You send over the list of your drivers. They're going to send you back a list of who they want to look at. Now, be aware, you know, they come in for their audit. And um, they're looking at five out of, say, 30 people. And they plan on being there for the next two days because they do so much more than just DQF while they're there and, and doing the audits. If they find, you know, a consistent pattern with those five, they're going to request more. And those are on demand. Okay. How do they typically select drivers that they want to see the DQF from? It's supposed to be random. It is supposed to be random. We all know that auditors have access to different law enforcement databases and different, you know, um, roadside inspection information. We all know that that's out there, but it is supposed to be a random process. Okay. And then um, talk to me about uh, about the severity of the fines with a DOT audit. There's two groupings of fines. I mean, there's, you know, there, there's fines, which are acute and critical, and then there's the slap on the wrist, meaning you get, you know, written up saying, we know you're trying to do your best, and we know that these just kind of squeak through the cracks, um, kind of keep an eye on them. There's no fines associated with those situations unless they come back and they find out that you continue to repeat those types of issues, then they're going to go ahead and, and look at fining you. Acute is something, you know, maybe you had one person on the road with a roadside inspection and his um, medical certificate was expired. And, again, it's a one-time incident. They're probably not going to do a whole lot. They're really, again, looking for a pattern. Critical is, is willful misconduct, where you're constantly doing the same error with your files, not keeping all the paper together or electronic format or not running MVRs on people or not ensuring that they have their physical exam done. Um, doing things like that, um, they're going to look at critical when it comes to DQS specifically. Other areas of the audit, they're going to look at, you know, vehicles. They're going to look at maintenance records. They're going to look at inspection records. They're going to look at um, your DBIRs. They're going to look at different things like that. But specific to DQF, I think the number one item um, is probably driver fitness where fines come out. So it's in that area of being fit for duty, making sure that medical certificate is up to date and so forth. But critical is willful misconduct. The cue is, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of a pattern, but we don't think it's willful. And Haley, I have a question that came in that, well, either one of you might be able to answer actually. What are the worst case scenario consequences for a DQF audit that's relative to like an HOS or a DNA audit? Can you speak to that at all? I cannot. Um, this is Haley. You know, I didn't get, you know, much involved with hours of service and so forth. Um, the ultimate consequence for any audit, you know, the worst um, consequence is your business shut down or you're temporarily right. suspended for 30 days. So, you know, that's kind of the worst case scenario, regardless of which area of the audit is egregious or, or has some serious issues. Okay, thanks. Thanks for all those answers. All right, let's dive right into what um, what you need in uh, your DQF. All right, the first thing is a DOT compliant application. Um, and so you can find all the specifics around um, what you need in an application at um, section 391.21. Um, and so, Broad level that they we're just going to kind of run through these fairly quickly. Um, it needs to have the name, address, date of birth, and social security number of the applicant, the addresses where they've lived for the prior three years, license information, the um, applicant's experience, um, any accidents for the prior three years with details, um, all driving violations for the prior three years. Um, if there's ever been a denial, a uh, revocation or suspension of any license, the detail on that or a statement that no such action has occurred. Um, and then uh, prior employment details. Um, if 
they uh, you need you must have at least past three years for any uh, prior employment. Um, but if they are uh, have had previous driving experience, you need the past ten years of driving experience. Um, and then I think we've kind of run um, this slide into two because there's so many things that have to be in the application for uh, a DOT compliant application. Um, at the end of your application, there needs to be a very specific certification. Um, I've quoted some of the language there. It needs to say that it is uh, true and complete to the best of my knowledge and the applicant has to sign it. Um, so this language is specific in the regulation. You have to have that in there. Um, and then the regulations also say that you have to inform the applicant that prior employers will be contacted regarding their safety performance history. We're going to get into that a little bit later in this um, webinar as well. And then um, you have to inform the applicant of the due process rights regarding investigation. Um, so this regulation, it's important to keep in mind, it's a lot of stuff that has to be in the application, but it also only lays out the minimum requirements. There can be other um, questions that you as a business want in your employment application and you are, um, you know, uh, can, can add those in. Um, so was there one more slide on this? I think so. And we've also got a question too. There's one more. Let's go ahead and finish this up. Okay. So um, why is the application important for your DQS? And that's because the regulation says very uh, explicitly that um, no, um, person shall, shall not drive a commercial motor vehicle unless completed and furnished application for employment that meets the requirements of section 391.21. So the regulations specifically say that um, you, you cannot have a driver in a commercial motor vehicle unless you have these specific elements in an application for employment. And so the application um, needs to go into the DQS during the employment of the driver plus three years. And the DQF file really needs to have um, any updates to the application. So if you are processing a driver and there are um, you know, changes and updates made, you want that most recent um, up-to-date information and you want that signed off on by the applicant. Uh, so. Okay, so the question we have is about violations on the application, does it include violations that are found on the PSP or just the MVR? Um, well, I think it's actually more specific than that. The regulations define what an accident means. Um, and so um, if it is an accident that would be reported to the FMCSA, so a fatality, um, one that has um, injuries involved, if there are one or more motor vehicles that, um, that get what they, quote, disabling damage, um, then it's an accident that needs to be on there. Um, so the, the regulations actually specifically exclude certain types of accidents, which include um, like an occurrence that involves loading or unloading, you know, cargo. Um, it, it, this is sort of a gray area of the regulations. What, what does an accident really mean? Um, I always caution people to err on the side of caution um, and, uh, um, and and on what is an accident, what is an occurrence. Um, so uh, Haley might be able to speak to that a little bit more, but I would say um, you know that the regulations pretty well define what an accident is. Yeah, yeah Shannon's absolutely correct. It's it's very well defined from the accident perspective. On the violation perspective, um, you know that goes if, if you're looking at like your your certificate of violations that section of the dqf regs you'll see where you know it has to be um that you were convicted you had to have paid a fine you um there's certain requirements that are listed in there uh that that constitute the violations but there's also a table associated with that that you need to pay attention to and i believe that that is in I'm trying to think real quick. 383.51 is the disqualifications of drivers and the penalties. There's some um, tables in there that give you guidance on violations, ticketing, speeding, whether it's in a commercial motor vehicle, whether it's in their own personal vehicle or another vehicle. Um, you know, those should be things that, that are represented. With us, you know, with 10th Street, we have the confirmation Intel app. 
So if you're updating something, you find something on the MVR that shows a violation, they didn't list it on the application and you believe it should be there, you do the update, um, it's critical that you also get a new signature. You know, as Shannon mentioned earlier as well, that signature is important because that is the legal document. That's the certifying statement that the driver believes everything to be true, and he's signing that. So if you're making updates from an MVR, um, you find other licenses on a SID list, anything like that that you're wanting to update on the application, make sure that that driver is also truly certifying with that statement and re-signing the documentation um, that he agrees with it. If he doesn't sign it, it, it's, it's constituted as he doesn't agree, and um, you know that could come up later on either from the driver, I didn't agree with this, after he's employed, or it could come up with you know an audit. Great, thanks Haley. And then one more question here, what does it mean to inform the applicant of their rights regarding the investigation? So um, what, what I mean by that is you have to tell them, you have to tell the applicant that you're going to a disclosure that and they have that you're going to be pulling their safety performance history um, information. And um, like I said, we're going to go through what that is. But then you also have to notify them of their due process rights, which is their right essentially is the right to dispute any inaccurate information they have. So this goes. Um, deep into the FCRA and then consumer reporting guidelines, um, but it also exists within um, the um, FMCSA regulations. So um, they have the right to, to see the reports. Um, they have a right to, um, to dispute the information. And uh, so it's essentially just um, telling them that they have those rights. If you provide an applicant with their FCRA summary of rights, um, and if you have uh, your disclosure and authorizations looked at by um, a qualified attorney, um, then likely you have those um, already built into your application. It usually comes after they sign for um, the certification in, in the application. There are usually a number of disclosures and authorizations. And um, everybody kind of refers to them as different things. It might be uh, the drug and alcohol disclosure. It might just be the release. So everybody kind of has a little bit different language in how they refer to it. But that's what it is. It's, re it's um, informing them of their right to um, see the information, to know what it is, and to dispute it if it's incorrect. Okay. What do you think, what would the ramifications be if they update the Intel app and then they forget to get an updated signature? You know, I think that, a, that it's just going to be the, the potential for a DOT auditor to find that. Um, so I think, um, and Haley can speak to this a little bit, I think a DOT auditor is really going to want to see things like gaps in employment, um, employment history, and then um, any violations that they've had, any in particular to um, drug and alcohol violations or um, to <clears throat> accidents. And so if there are changes to those, those are going to be um, highly of interest to a DOT auditor. Um, and then things also like if they, if an uh, employee just fails, uh, or I'm sorry, an applicant just leaves off a prior employer, um, th those are going to be things that an auditor is going to be um, interested in seeing. And so if you don't go back and get that confirmation signature, um, the risk is that it's just, um, it's just messy. And if you have, a, you know, a whole lot of applications in your DQFs when a DOT auditor comes in and that aren't updated, that aren't complete, um, I, I don't think they're going to like that very much. Okay, thanks. We have a couple more, but I'm going to hold off. We're going to keep on moving just to keep the flow going, but we'll come back to those questions that we didn't get to at the end of the webinar. We have a whole lot more to cover. So um, moving on to the next thing that is required in a DQF is the uh, motor vehicle records. So section 391.23A1 talks about the initial um, MVR. You, uh, the regulation requires that you obtain it within 30 days of hire. The best practice, however, is to obtain it prior to employment. I think most of our clients do that, um, and that's certainly, um, you want to see what, what their MVR says before you bring them on board and, and put them in a truck. Um, and so you, you have to pull that MVR for each state where the driver has had a license during the prior three years. So that's the initial MVR. It must be included in the driver's DQF 
um, during their employment. Um, I just uh, have a little note here. Um, because we talked so much about the FCRA and consumer reports, if you obtain your MVRs from a third party and not directly from the state, these are considered consumer reports and they would be subject to the FCRA and any state and local laws um, regarding consumer reports. So just, just keep that in mind. All right, also um, related to MVRs, but another line item in the DQF is the annual inquiry and review. So you need to pull an annual MVR, but that means that you would obtain an MVR every 12 months on a driver. Um, and then you wanna keep a copy in the DQF. You need to retain it for three years, even after the driver leaves your employment. And then you also need to have a note that just merely says that you've reviewed that MVR at least once every 12 months. Um, in that note, you need to have the name of the reviewer, the date of the review, and then you must um, keep that for three years after the driver leaves your employment. Um, I, I've always wondered, and Haley, this would be a, a great thing that you, you might know, and if you don't, I apologize, but when a DOT auditor comes in and is looking at the MVR, Will, will they go independently pull an MVR on drivers? No, no they're, they're not going to, number one, spend the money or go through that process to have something like that done. Um, they're going to look at everything, you know, within the file. If, um, if they, you know, see something weird, like the review isn't being done, they might um, question something. Uh, they might write you up and say that, you know, you didn't run it within, it's 12 months in one day, you should have ran it before. Those are the things that they're going to look at. They're also going to look at the disqualifications. So are there any items on these two MBRs or the, all the MBRs that are in the file that really truly disqualify this applicant from driving or this employee, contractor from driving? That's going to be their main focus with the MBRs, but they're not going to run one. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, moving on. The next thing you need to have in the DQF is a CDL or road test certification. You can fulfill this requirement um, one of three ways. You can keep a copy of the CDL. You can get a road test certificate, or you can have the equivalent certificate conducted by another motor carrier within the past three years. Um, so these are um, fairly basic, but this is just you know your records that the driver is qualified. Um, the, the qualifications of the drivers are something that the DOT, DOT auditors are interested in. Um, so, you know, I think Haley has some, some good knowledge here around best practices, and I'm going to let her speak to that. Um, so that, that's correct. Uh, with best practices, and I know it's, it's difficult. You know, we can't all um, have that position out there where somebody is, is always conducting a road test or they're looking at that, you know, do you meet the skills? You obviously have a CDL. So clearly you have the skills um, to drive. But I think it's just extra protection for you to have a copy of that CDL and do a road test if feasible. What it does is it proves, it not only shows that they have the CDL, which they had to have the skill to get the CDL, but it also proves that they had the skill at the time that you hired them or within a certain period of time that you hired them. And I think that is a stronger protection to the employer should something ever happen with that specific driver. So if there's accidents in the future, um, again, I always bring up those worst case scenarios, uh, a fatality involved accident, you know, something like that. You've got in, a, in certain different situations, you've got all the material present that showed that that driver had the skill at the time. And again, it's not required. You know, clearly the regs are, are you know, give you options. Um, Shannon just presented those options. I just think it's the best practice that if it's affordable and you can do the road test in addition to the CDL, I think it's highly recommended. Yeah, great, great thought, Haley. I appreciate that. Okay, um, the annual um, certification of violations. So um, you want the record of violations. This is found at section 391.27. Um, and it is a list of traffic violations other than parking that the driver has been convicted of for the previous 12 months. Um, and so you must, the regulations require that you get this in place um, every 12 months. And um, you, you need to have it in the DQF, even if there aren't any violations, just have a statement. 
in there um, and a, a signature that says that there aren't. Um, so um, that's one of those things, it's another one of those things that you have to keep track of, watch the dates on, and, um, and, and keep in there. What, uh, oh, no, let's, let's go ahead and move on to the next one, the, the medical examiner certificate, great. Um, okay, so on this one, 391.43i, it has to be conducted by a licensed medical examiner that is listed on the FMCSA National Registry. Um, <laughs> some things that, that sometimes get um, missed, you'll get that um, certificate back and it won't have the full name, office address, and telephone number of the medical examiner. So that's just one double check you want to make. And then also that the medical examiner actually signed and dated it. Um, these are valid uh, for 24 months unless noted otherwise. Um, and Haley can speak to this, but that's one of the things you, you want to make sure of. If it's less than 24 months, you want to note it and you want to make sure you come back to it. Um, is, is that right, Haley? Is that kind of one of the things that would jump out to a DOT auditor? Exactly. So that's the driver fitness. If someone, you know, has hypertension and they're on what we call a limited certification. So um, six months, three months, you know, due to blood pressure. And you're not tracking that. You're not making sure at that three-month period or whenever that, that cert certificate is issued through um, that that person needs to go back in and get an updated certificate and so forth. That's critical so because that is driver, driver fitness and it is something that is going to stand out on an inspection, in an accident, um, in your own business. Um, it's just prudent to make sure that those are being tracked. They're rare. They're not as common, I think, as as they used to be. Um, maybe they're more common in, in some of your businesses, but the, the traditional is 24 months. Also on the, the certificate itself, you want to make sure that the medical examiner has his registry number as well. That's required on the new certificate. Oh, that, that's, that's right. Thank you for pointing that out, Haley. Um, and, um, and, and it's important to note that they must have been on um, the registry at or before the time of the exam. So if you have one and then they weren't on the registry until a month later or a few months later, that, um, that certificate is not good. They need to be on the registry at or before um, the time of the exam. Um, actually, if you could go back just one, I want, there's sure. one other thing I want to add on this slide. Um, so you need to keep that certificate in there um, for three years after the driver leaves your employment. Um, and then one little note, we try to stay on top of things, um, but, and many of you might know this already, but um, come June 22nd of 2021, there's going to be a change in this where um, anyone, uh, driver that's found not qualified under um, medical examination will have to be reported to the FMCSA. Um, and the medical examiner themselves will have to report them. And then any previous medical certificates um, issued to that driver will be considered invalid. Um, so that's something that, that is coming up and um, uh, something to be aware of. Okay, I've got a question here we can throw out. Do you keep the original medical certificate on file after it expires or do you just discard the expired one for the new certificate? Um, I don't think there, if you have a new one, I don't think there's any, rec well, you might want, yeah, no, you would want to hold on to it so that you could show that at least, um, like, during their prior employment, they um, had it. But if it's if it's older than three years, um, I would say you wouldn't need to keep it. Haley, do you have anything different to add there? I agree. So I would always keep that initial one. Um, so if you're performing the exam yourself or if you accept a previous medical certificate in your business, I would still keep that, you know, just to show that you did your due diligence and followed everything when you were hiring that individual. Um, one thing to be aware of with DQF, the more information that you have in it, the more that's subjected to audit. So if you're keeping tons and tons of documentation in the file, you have 15 MBRs because they've been with you, you know, for 15 years. You have 15 medical certificates um, because they've been with you, you know, 25 to 30 years. Um, everything that's in that file is subject to audit. 
So only, you know, my advice would be that you follow the regs. The best practice is only give the auditors what they are required to see. So if you're just hoarding that information, um, just be aware that it's subject to audit. Yeah, that's a, a great thing to keep in mind. Okay, uh, and then on the next slide here, um, section 391.51B9, um, it, you have to have just a note, uh, a record that verifies that the medical examiner was authorized on the national registry. Um, and that also must be retained for three years um, after the driver leaves your employment. So I was going to try and combine those two slides, but I just couldn't quite fit it all on there. <laughs> and then so is there, is, where can they find national registry that they can search to make sure that their certs are valid? Um, that's a that's a question. Um, but there is a um, link that we can post. I'm sure there is. Let me. I can look too. Yep, and you can just Google, you know, FMCSA National Medical Registry. They have their own page within the FMCSA. Um, you can put the individual in there. Um, Shannon noted on the last page that you know you need to have that note placed in there on or before um, the date of the exam doing it after the exam, so having an exam and then three months later putting a note in there doesn't show that the medical examiner was indeed certified at that time. Something could have been um, incomplete and he just recently got recertified when you ran the report um, three months after the date of the applicant or the date of the exam, but in the regs it specifically says on or before um, the actual exam. So I just sent um, Leah a link, and she is going to um, hopefully be able to post it, but it's the link to the FMCSA page on the National Registry, so that you can, you can go find that. Okay, great. I'm going to grab it. Oh. Uh, and also, so did one of our wonderful, oh, two of our wonderful uh, attendees out there also posted the link, so I really appreciate you guys, <laughs> you know, helping us. That's really great. So I'll post those. In one second, and then we move on so we can continue. Okay, so background investigations. This is the um, sort of the the, the big <laughs> big things when you're hiring um, drivers. Um, Section 391.23 requires that you do an investigation and an inquiry. So there are two. Um, Essentially, the regulations break it up into two areas, Driver, drivers hired before October 30th of 2004 and drivers hired after October 30th of 2004. Um, 2004 is, seems like a very long time ago now, and um, but some of you might still have drivers out there that um, have been around since 2004. Um, it's, it's probably not likely, but, but you might. Um, okay, so if it's before 2004, it's a lot easier. Employment verifications for all employers for three years prior to the application or a record of a good faith effort to get those employment verifications. You need to include that in the DQF within 30 days after hire and maintain it during employment. However, if it was after uh, October 30th of 2004, you, uh, the regulations require that you look into the safety performance history um, of all former DOT regulated employers for the three years prior to the application date, or you have to have a record of a good faith effort to do that. So um, one interesting thing to note, is when I'm, the next slide we're gonna touch on the specifics of the safety performance history data, but is that the regulations actually call for a, uh, the safety performance history data to be included in a separate, what they call driver investigation history file um, and so this data needs to be placed in that file within 30 days after hire and maintained um, during employment. So I know that it's fairly common in the industry to get these pretty early on, uh, maybe even before you hire the driver. Um, but uh, the key is the whole point, the purpose of having a separate file for the safety performance history is essentially to keep it confidential. It's so it's secure, it's confidential, and that you know not just everybody has access and availability to go um, um, look and see what's in that data. Um, I think if you if you maintain your DQF 
and you, you put the safety performance history data in the DQF, but you maintain your DQF in a way that is very secure and very um, uh, not easily accessed, only the people necessary have it, then I think you're, you're still going to be good. Um, but technically, the regulations talk about a separate driver investigation history file. Okay, so what is, uh, okay, so the regulations, Nope. Yep. Keep moving. Okay. <laughs> Didn't know if I went, jumped ahead there. No, you're good. Thank you. Okay. So, um, section D says that a, a prospective carrier must investigate and the previous employer must provide. So these are the things that the safety performance history data includes, and that is the employment verification information, um, any accidents, and that includes accidents reported to the FMCSA accident register for the previous three years. And so, like I talked about before, those are injuries, fatalities, and disabling damage. You may report more detailed minor accidents, so you are allowed to report other things, um, but you must report injuries, fatalities, and disabling damage. And then if there have been any alcohol or controlled substance violations in the previous three years, um, of course, those, that encompasses a whole list of things, which includes positive tests, refusals to test, so on and so forth. Um, and, and then um, you need to have a driver authorization to obtain these things. Um, these are considered consumer reports subject to the FCRA if you get them from third parties, if you get them directly from another carrier, um, you still need the authorization, but it won't be considered a consumer report. If you get them from a third party, like 10th Street, if you use Exchange, or if you use um, you know, another database that you pull prior employment um, verifications from, um, that would be considered a consumer report. Either way, you have to have the driver's authorization to go get this information, and you need to keep that driver authorization in the safety performance history file as well. Uh, so I know that is a whole host of information. I'm sure there are several questions um, about those. I think that this is probably the data that is, is very um, interesting for auditors. Haley, what can you tell me about that? What are auditors looking for on the safety performance history data? It is. Again, they're looking for the disqualification of drivers. They're looking, you know, for keeping the roadways safe and, and making sure that there's um, situations where someone who has a common denominator with having accidents and violations and um, the business not really paying attention to that and, you know, place them in a vehicle, um, you know, that's what they're looking for. So they're really focused on the injuries, the fatalities. Um, I don't, you know, back when safety performance first came out for any of those those people that are on the phone back when this first came out, there was so much Q&A about it with FMCSA. It was really confusing. They had all these additional pages um, in the regulations that are now gone about how you, this had to be under lock and key and all of these different things. Um, I think what their goal back then was is they didn't want someone in a hiring position, you know, making a decision on someone who tested positive for alcohol or um, happened to have had a fatality but really didn't dig into that information and find out that it, it was not their fault. You know, there were things like that um, that was a big concern. That's one of the reasons why there's a recommendation to have things separate. But um, that's what they're looking for. What's spelled out here, they're looking at – they're looking for a pattern. They're always looking for a pattern. And safety performance became a big issue back in 2004, um, making sure that things were recorded because, you know, people would job hop. They would hide this information. And that's why it became so so prudent for us to, to be able to have these things put forth. You know, I think we've done the, the drug and alcohol tests at the Reagan era. And um, so, you know, from that standpoint, we've always known about those, but, but putting more details surrounding the accidents really is what developed the safety performance history. Yeah, that's great. Thank you um, so much for that. And I just want to add that one thing that's really important, um, I, and I talked about the driver authorization, this is the other area where you also need to um, inform the driver of their due process rights, which is to review the information um, received to correct or provide a rebuttal to any of it. So um, in addition to the driver authorization, you're going to want to somehow document or be able to show um, that you also provided the driver their due process rights here. Um, and then so if you use Exchange, um, you, uh, you know that we, we help you with this. We help you. It's a network um, with other um, driving um, carriers that you can um, exchange this information. It's quick. It's fast. Um, we make it as um, 
as painless as possible. Yep. Um, so I, I, uh, if you're not providing over the network, we make it a lot easier. If you're not requesting over the network, it's, um, it's free and you should look into it. Okay, um, so this is just a little bit on the driver investigation history file. Um, like I said before, access should be limited to only those involved in the hiring decision. It needs to be maintained in a secure location with controlled access. You need to include the safety performance history responses or the good faith effort and the authorization, um, as well as the authorization to obtain alcohol and uh, controlled substance history. And then you need to keep these files during employment plus three years. So I do have a question I'm going to go ahead and ask right now. Um, a couple of them. Uh, let's see. So this person's asking basically if we have to, they have to, keep, they have to keep, basically they can have just the three year, three years of the of records and everything else can be eliminated because they're saying they're, they're DQF, they're busting at the seams and they're not sure, they don't feel comfortable probably getting rid of everything, but if they, you know, what can you, Okay, yeah, um, so so the requirement is that it be kept during employment plus um, three years. So if an auditor comes in, they're going to look back three years. Um, I don't I don't think, and Haley, you can speak to this. I don't think they're going to look back five years. I don't think they're going to look back um, ten years. Now that would be for employees that are no longer there. Um, if the if the employee is still there, they you have to keep these documents on file during the entire entirety of their employment. So if they're there for ten years, you need you need so you do need ten years. Okay, this person yeah, I found the question. So they're asking if a driver's been with the company since 2011, the only paperwork that needs and this is she's one in confirmation, uh, the only paperwork that needs to be in their DQF is from the last three years. No. So no. No, there is there is a lot that needs to be kept during the entire employment of the driver plus an additional three years after the uh, employment has ended. And as for it busting at the seams, maybe we can help you with that when we get to this, this last slide about things that you should not keep in your DQF, so that might help you clear some of that unnecessary paper out. Absolutely. So I think that's actually the next slide. Yeah, great. Great segue. Mm -hmm. What not to keep in a DQF? So like Haley said, Earlier, remember that everything in um, that DQF is fair game for a DOT auditor. So if you hand them over, um, you know, a file that has I-9s, HR documents, policy sign-offs, um, benefits info, training records, those are things that are not required, but an auditor is going to look at because you've just handed it to them and it becomes fair game. So. Um, so, so keep that in mind. You don't want to keep HR type files in your DQF. Just keep what the regulations require. No I-9s, no disciplinary records, no benefits. Um, you want to keep the handbook sign-off, policy sign-off. Keep those out of the DQF. The only one, the only policy sign that you might want to consider having in your DQF is the signature of the driver on like a drug and alcohol policy that you have. Um, that might uh, just benefit you when a DOT auditor is looking at that saying, yep, the, the uh, driver has looked at that, they've signed off on it, they agree to it. It's not required, um, but it might just be a good idea. Um, training records, you don't want to keep those in the DQF. Long form physical exam results, you don't want to keep those in the DQF. Now, the D DOT auditor might ask for those, they might want to see those, but there's, there's no requirement to keep them in the file. Um, and then also drug and alcohol results, no requirement to keep them in the file. Haley, do you have anything to add on this? Um, other than, you know, there's a good resource. <clears throat> it's 391.51. It's the general requirements. That will specifically tell you what has to be kept for how long um, during employment or if you can toss it, you know, every time it renews. That is your guidance. That's where to go look if you're trying to find out what has to be kept and what can't be kept. Outside of what Shannon said, you know, keeping anything other than the absolute requirements of DQF, as a best practice, I just wouldn't add anything else on in. Not even the FMCSR, you know, sign that you received the policy book. I, none of that. I, I would keep them, just not in DQF. So, again, anything that's in there is fair game, whether it's an electronic system or, or whether it's paper-based. Great. Okay, so 
Um, the next slide, I think we're going to talk about some best practices. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to ask the question, just to oh, reiterate, yeah. though. What about the, they're asking about the drug test. They think that they had, you know, were under the impression that the drug test did have to be kept. So can you talk a little bit about, about why that would not be a good file to keep in a DQF? Um, the, the actual results of the drug and alcohol tests are not required to be kept in, in the DQF. And I, I, certainly you need to keep them, um, but um, I wouldn't keep them in the DQF. I would just have access to them. I mean, Haley, do you have any insight here onto that? Um, so there's, you know, the way that the regs were written, there's three different files that are out there. So there's the um, DQF, there's the drug and alcohol, and there's a driver investigation file. And um, throughout the years, those have been combined, right? A lot of people will, um, vendors out there that provide paperwork, they'll they'll have an all-in-one, they'll call it an all-in-one. Um, again, you know, you have to keep drug and alcohol information. It's subject to the audit if they're out there auditing you, but it's not part of the DQF portion of the audit. You still have to have it. It's part of the drug and alcohol audit, you know, seeing, making sure you're doing randoms, making sure you're doing all the components that you need to, that you have good record keeping, that you're doing your MIS reports, doing all of your items like that, but it, it's just not required in DQF. It's required, just not in the DQF file. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. So some best practices on DQF. Don't wait until you hear from an auditor that they're on their way to get your DQF in order. Um, you want to keep your um, files organized and neat. You want to stay on top of them um, throughout the um, employment history of a driver. Um, Perform internal audits and internal reviews of your DQF. Just you know, put it on the calendar. Um, do it a couple of times a year. Um, you you definitely want to stay on top of it and stay ahead of the DOT auditors. Um, have a checklist that you can follow um, on what needs to be there, what you have, what you don't have. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend an electronic file that has an alert system. Um, so that you know when things are um, on, when things are about to expire, you know when that medical certificate is about to expire, you know when that NVR is about to expire. Um, you definitely want to have an electronic file, uh, or, I'm sorry, an alert system somehow um, with your DQF. If it's if it's uh, it, it, an electronic file, usually can be built that it will do that. And then you want to make sure that it's limited access and secure. If you have it just stored in a filing cabinet, um, you know next to your, um, uh, where your customers and your drivers and everybody comes in to, to, you know, walk into your building, that might not be the most limited um, and secure access. And um, so you, you want to keep it filed away. You want to keep it locked up if it's not um, secured electronically. Um, so those are all sort of the best practices with DQF. The main thing is, is that you're definitely going to um, want to stay on top of it and not wait until you get a DOT audit. Okay, and so we like to keep these webinars on compliance more educational for you guys. You know, we want to remain your partners in compliance more than anything else. But before we get to the rest of the questions, we just wanted to let you know that 10th Street has solutions in place for all of these things that we've talked about today, starting with our DOT compliant Intella app and the follow-up confirmation Intella app that records all of your updates. The exchange for employment verifications, which, you know, like Shannon was saying, is a lot faster, a lot easier. It means no more faxing, mainly you can use our network. It's just uh, less redundant. And a comprehensive safety management service that we just rolled out last year at our user conference that gave a big boost to our traditional line of DQF services. So this may be new to a lot of people still. We've added a lot of new amenities, so you should want to maybe take a look at that and we can help see how we can help you there. We have now everything under our new DQF Control Center, which includes all the services you see below there. Uh, we give you an easy way to handle your annual MVR process and it removes all the tedium and monotony, and you can actually see where in the process all of your drivers are and who still needs the, uh, the signatures, the counter signatures. And it makes it possible for you to send a digital COV to your drivers. You can order MVRs in bulk. You can configure your missing expired documents alerts to anybody in your company, including drivers. And then you can capture CDLs or really any document that you like with the document uploader service that's also part of the safety management uh, or annual MVR process. Um, 
this, you know, just essentially all of it, removes the paper head out, headache and uh, along with a lot of repetition. And then a second component that we do have, just to tell you very briefly, that we're calling door management, provides digital accident and incident forms to fill out for your drivers, which it then compiles into an accident registry report. And this just gives you a high level kind of cumulative view of all your drivers' accidents and incidents so they don't happen to get buried in all of your other documents. It just brings them to the forefront and you can manage them and work them a lot easier. And we have a points management tool that works along with side of this that lets you assign points to these accidents and incidents and uses your own business rules to then create workflow and automation around that. So you can, however your company handles those, we can work that into the points management uh, tool. So I know that's a lot. I just wanted to breeze through really quickly because, like I said, we want to stay on the educational side of things and we want to get to the remaining questions. But I have attached a few cut sheets to help you learn more about all of these services. So you can find them in your handout section in your GoToWebinar panel. Um, got one on the Intella app, one on Exchange, and then a couple on the safety management, DQF, and then driver management as well. So take a look at those. Let us know if you have questions, and we will be happy to answer those. I just want to add, um, when, um, when 10th Street develops these products, we develop them with compliance, um, with the regulations in mind. We literally right. uh, develop them in and around um, the regulations, and both practically speaking, what can help our clients, but also um, what is compliant to, so that they are, uh, so that you all as our clients are, are compliant with the law and, and what you need. Um, so that's, that's really what we're trying to do with our products here as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you for adding that. Okay, and so questions. Let's try to go back and get some of these ones that we missed. Oh, or not. Put them over there. I don't know why they went over there. <laughs> Sorry if you guys are seeing I just, uh, I just want to say quickly, um, on, uh, on these compliance webinars, we are always looking for really good uh, topics and programs, we're kind of searching for what do you all need, what do you all want to hear more on. So if you have any ideas, um, whether we, we've talked about adverse action, we've talked about DQF, we've kind of done a general broad overview of, of some hot topics and general questions that we get. Um, so other questions about um, specific items that you have and or that you would like us to cover on a deep dive topic. Please message in and, um, and and let us know what that is because we would really uh, we'd really like some ideas from you on what we can what information we can give you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm seeing that there's some that we haven't answered. There's a few about the medical long form that I think we got to. Brian. So good faith, I think that was mentioned maybe a couple of times. Is there, what do, would you define as good, a good faith effort? Is there a number of attempts required for that to be a good faith or? So I don't know that it's ever, the, the regulations certainly don't say a good faith attempt means this many times. But what, um, what I think there has been, and I don't know if it's cases or a best practices, but I think there has somewhere, it has been said that if you try three different times that that can be considered a good faith attempt. Um, now you don't want to just try three times within a 24 hour period, right? Like you, you have to be reasonable about it. So that you, there actually has to be good faith behind it. You know, so if you make a request and a couple of days later, there's been no response, you make another request, a few days later, there's still no been, been no response. Um, it's always best to be able to say you picked up the phone and called, you know, if you, um, if you give it three attempts, which includes, you know, a phone call, trying to find the right person, trying to talk to somebody, um, you know, that's going to be a good faith attempt. Um, and, I mean, the regulations allow you to report a carrier that doesn't respond. Remember, they have 30 days to respond. So, um, you know, that's, that's the other thing. So, um, if, if you're just trying, you know, three times in 24 hours, that's probably not going to be good faith. If you just try once and you don't get a response, I don't know that that's going to be good faith either, um, but but I think if you try three times and that has included you picked up the phone, tried to call them and say, hey, what, uh, you know, how can I get this information, um, and then they still refuse to provide it to you within 30 days, um, you know that 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 would be that would be considered good faith. But Haley, do you have anything to add on that? No, that's um, that's one of those great loopholes in in the regulations. You know, they're they're black and white, but they're really gray. So um, they don't define good faith. 
it's, it's just not defined. So um, it's very rare that you would ever see an auditor really bring that to your attention. They might, you know, talk to you about it in passing. Did you really, really attempt this? How did you prove it? Um, that's what's great about exchange is it does prove it. And um, from that perspective, it works out really well. But um, good faith is, is just kind of put out there, and it really doesn't give guidance on to what good faith means. Okay, so since I upload all of, those, all of these documents into 10 Street now, do I have to keep a hard copy? Uh, no, no. We, if you, um, if you use our DQF services, our safety management tool, we keep your documents and your records um, secure. We are um, SOC 2 type 2 um, certified. I, I think I said that right. Compliant, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, compliant. Thank you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not, I'm not the computer guy, but I, uh, but I, I do deal with um, the security of our system a lot. We have a, that is. We have a whole uh, page where you can check out um, our certification on the SOC 2 Type 2, um, but we uh, we have good certifications in place. We keep your data secure, and um, so I would say no. You can you would as long as you can access it, um, and um, you know then then no, you would not. It does not need to be kept in a hard file if you have a good electronic filing system, and that would include with us. Yes, great. Okay, so. We what about rehires? They have people have drivers who go back and forth. They they come to the company, they leave, they come back later, and they they come back, they leave. Uh, what about them? What kind of advice can you say? Should, you know, you know, it's really going to be on a case by case basis. That's um, that's a little bit hard to answer without knowing the specifics of what the driver is. You know, if they have left for six months and come back, that's a different answer than if they. Um, left for five years and came back. So um, it, that really depends on the circumstances. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd say there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, DQF consultants. There's um, lawyers that deal specifically in this with this issue. But um, if you if you have those specific type questions, please feel free to contact one of those people and, and really look into it. Um, but the regulations are pretty clear during that you need to keep the DQF file um, during employment and then um, so, uh, three years after that. Um, and you can go directly to the regs and look at what they say as far as the, the time length and, and how to keep them. So that might be the best way to answer your question too, is to just um, just look up the regs. And uh, 391.51 is a good place to start and, um, and go from there. Okay, great. Um, I have a couple kind of one-off questions. I'm going through these right now and clicking trying to get, I'm glad we've got so much, and you guys are just so interested, that just makes us feel like we're actually doing something that's helpful and worthwhile, so we really appreciate your time <laughs> and all the questions. Um, we're going to get to the ones that we didn't get to, we're right at the top of the hour at this point, so a little after, after actually, and so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up, but we do apologize for not getting to everybody's questions, but we'll get to them after the webinar on a case, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I just want to say, you know, again, that I really appreciate everybody joining us. We know that you're really busy, and we hope that we've given you, you know, everything that you need now to move forward with DQF successfully so that you stay compliant. And I want to really thank Shannon and Haley for being with us as well. Thank you all so much. And um, again, if you have questions, um, please feel free to contact your account manager um, or call us at uh, the number listed there. Um, Haley and I, um, you know, put on the webinar, but if, if you could please contact your account manager or your advisor, they would probably be best to direct your questions where they need to go. Um, Haley and I are so happy to join you for this webinar and, and everything, but but we, as far as providing legal advice and things along those individually, um, we're really unable to do that. We just want to give you the information that we have on hand. So um, thank you all so much for attending, and um, yeah, we look forward to the next compliance webinar. Yep, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.